see and visit the blind spots. This is, this is really cool. Um, and the implications in a multi-generational workforce. I think we're all dealing with at least three, probably five different generations sitting within your own workforces. I think what they have to say over the next 35 or 40 minutes will shed some light on it. So, my friend Eric. I, I always love it when you get applause before you've done anything. Um, you, you talk about blind spots. My wife, Sharon, I've been married for 25 years. Uh, anniversary was April 10th. She still puts up with me. Um, she hadn't had an accident in 35 years. And about a week and a half ago, she was merging onto the road at 1792 and 436. And she checks. She's you know, that detailed personality. She'll check twice. And she didn't see somebody in the blind spot, went right down the whole side of the car. She was ticketed, first ticket she's had in 35 years. So we all have blind spots. In our business, we sometimes are too close to the problem and we don't see the things that we need to be doing. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take you through something that comes out of Dave Matson's new book, The Road to Excellence. We're actually starting a course on this. It's a 24 session course over two years. We're gonna do it in 35, 40 minutes, okay? So you guys listen fast. Pro blind spot number one, not having a process for hiring. How many of you have to hire people from time to time? Do you have a process to do that? Do you have a way to actually find the people that you need? So many times we hire people when there is a a hole, right? Somebody left, there's an emergency, we've got to fill a spot, and we hire wrongly. You don't have a process to hire. Now, how many of us are baby boomers in here? There's a couple of us that can still raise our hands, right? And how many are Gen X and Gen Y and the millennials? You, yeah, they're in the back. Yeah, we see you. Another one over here. You're a millennial, in case you don't know. Um, I have shoes older than you, just so you know. Why, why don't we have a process to hire? We hire based upon gut. We hire based upon the fact that we like somebody, we think they're gonna fit, and we don't, we're not doing it re regularly. But when we turn, and we're gonna pivot this into hiring different generations. So hiring different generations, what do they look for, Carson? First off, the traditionalists are pretty much retired. However, they've got a lot of money. Baby boomers are in their 50s and 60s. Gen X is 40s and the 50s. Gen Y tends to be around the 30s, and the millennials are in their 20s. <clears throat> Gen X and Gen Y tend to think that, well, I don't get a job. They've been taught that they don't get a job through answering an ad on Monster. You have to know somebody. And if I know Eric, here's my resume, dude, hire me. You don't have to go through this stuff. I'm your buddy. How many of you have seen a bad resume? They, they all read like, you know, this is, you know, it's like, a, it's, a, it's like a Hollywood review for a movie and you produce the movie and you wrote the review. But you don't need to go through this stuff. That's the way they feel. I know you. Let's get started. Hire me. And nine times out of ten. What does a bad hire cost? Boom. In the sales world, it's anywhere from one hundred fifty to $350,000. By the time you add up how much money you spent advertising, interviewing, hiring, training, putting them on salary, management time, burning leads, three months in, you realize that, well, Todd's really trying hard, but he hasn't made a deal yet. We'll give him another three months. And then six months in, well, they've been to the, the, hol the, you know, the holiday party. Everybody knows him. And... And, and it's not just what you pay for them, but what the lost opportunity cost. And in sales, it's extremely expensive. Internally, it can be just as expensive. Number two, Number two properly onboarding people. How many times do we hire and then forget? Salespeople, here's your lead list, here's the telephone, good luck, right? We'll give you a day's worth of training, you'll walk around, you'll spend a day riding with one or two of the people, but we don't actually give them what they need to get them on board properly. The folks in their 30s and 40s, the 20-year-olds, okay, what do, what do you want me to do? The baby boomers, I know you have a process for this, what is it? But the folks in their 30s and 40s have the attitude, give me a desk, a computer, and a phone. Actually, get out of, they don't get out of my way, yeah. A computer, and they've got a phone, 
So they don't really even need a desk. They just go, where do you want me to go? I, you know, this stuff, I don't need all this. I can start working today. And you tend to want to have that because, good, they're going to generate revenue sooner. So it sounds good, but no process. We wind up seeing them be very, very busy, but they're not being productive. Joe talked about prioritizing. If you don't give them specific tasks, if they're not accountable, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, there's something called the halo effect. You sit down with somebody, you like each other, they bond well with you. Oh, they know some people that you know, they've got a little bit of industry experience. You know, you read something good about them on LinkedIn. Um, you check the references, right? They were all glowing. But let me, in, in business, how many of you get asked for references from clients from time to time? Do you have any references? How many of you give bad ones? You give the guy or the gal who says, this guy, this lady walks on water, you need to hire them. So in hiring, it's the same thing. Do you, you know, we do a lot of things with salespeople. If I were interviewing you for a sales job, I would say, Aluska, are, are you any good at making cold calls? And you would say, no. well, then you're not interviewing for a sales job. <laughs> who here's in sales? <laughs> By the way, you're all in sales. All if you're married, sales. you're in sales. Are you any good at making cold calls, sir? Yeah. Well, great. Let's make one right now, and I'll hand him a phone. I'm not necessarily want to see him make the call. Is he starting to make excuses? Well, you know, I'm not really prepared. I don't know your... I'll pick up the phone and say, all right, am I selling what you sell or what I sold? Give me a phone number. I'll dial it. I'm not afraid of the phone. What's the worst thing that can happen on the phone? No. At the count of three, as loud and as nasty as you can, I want you to yell the word no at me. Are you ready? One, two, three, no. no! Any blood? Am I okay? What are they afraid of? Test them in the interview. Don't just take them at their word. Number three, not tying corporate goals to personal goals. Do you know what the top three goals of your top people are? And I'm not talking about that they want to sell X number or they need to accomplish things. Do you know what they're shooting for personally? Goals have to be emotional. You know, we buy from our child. Our six-year-old makes our buying decisions, going back to transactional analysis, parent, adult, child, ego states. If you don't know what your people are shooting for personally, are they looking to buy a house? Are they looking to get out of debt? Are they looking to put their kids through college? Are they looking to retire? And when are they looking to retire? If you don't know that stuff, can you do an effective job of tying what they're shooting for to what the company wants? And have you shared that goal with them? And generations are looking for different things. And I found this out the hard way. When you're hiring younger folks today, everybody says, well, we have two weeks paid vacation. And they'll go, OK, and they'll continue on. But if you use the phrase, are you looking for any more time off besides your vacation, you'll get the person says, oh yeah, I'm going to go hiking in Malaysia for a month next quarter. And I, you don't need to pay me. Well, that's going to affect their job. Hey, if you can be gone for a month, I don't know why I'm hiring you in the first place. But ask about unpaid vacations. I worked for a big corporation long ago in Lake Mary. They came out with a point system for benefits. You're an engineer level two, you get so many points, you can spend them on benefits. All the young people went to HR and said, well, you can trade in your vacation days to get more points and more insurance, right? Yes. Well, I'd like to trade in all my insurance points <laughs> to get more days off to go scuba diving. They don't know that you don't know. So ask, ask what their time off expectations are because you may come up with something that they think because you're not paying them, it's fine when you go. It's not, you have to be there to do the job or can you work remotely while you're gone? But these are all things that really impact your decisions that are hiring people. If you look at your own relationship, the things that motivate my wife don't necessarily motivate me. I mean, what motivates Scotty to get something done is not gonna motivate Christina. So. Are you aligning, are their goals aligned with where you want the company to take? I, I read this years and years ago. You know the big, uh, what are the big Budweiser horses called? Clydesdales? Clydesdales. Thank you for rescuing me. I appreciate that. Um, a Clydesdale, they have hauling contests. These are workhorses. They put a 5,000 pound block of concrete on the ground. A Clydesdale can pull a 5,000 pound a dead weight of concrete, just dragging along the ground. If you hook two Clydesdales up, logically, how much can they haul? 
25,000 pounds. Two together can pull five times as much as one can alone. So when you take your corporate goals, you find out what your people want, what they're shooting for. If you can align those, do you understand the power that it gives you to get things done within your organization? Yeah. That's kind of unrealistic, don't you think? I mean, Go check it on the internet after after the talk, yeah. not right now. But yeah. We can set a strict I mean, yeah. 100 employees, and you're going to try to align each employee up with the corporate goals. I mean, if you explain the corporate goals, and they got to come to work eight hours a day, five days a week, and and not be late and not leave early and not call and sick on Mondays or call out on Fridays. I don't see how you're going to tie our corporate goal is to get X amount of product out the door every single day. And they call in and we had our man short and everybody else has to work extra hard to get that stuff out the door. So I, I don't. But I, don't, our, I, I disagree with but you. But it's, all, it's all right. No, and I appreciate that. Here's the thing most company managers, most presidents, most owners, you don't know what your individual people are shooting for. If I know what they're trying, if, if you wanted to be taking a vacation, you're looking to get a new car, you know, you guys are looking to aim towards retirement, and if I can take my goals and in some way align them with where you're trying to head, not, it's not going to work 100% of the time, but if we, nine times out of ten, we don't know the top three things that our people are trying to achieve in their life. I mean, Joe talked about vision boards and stuff like that. I constantly have a board up over my desk that is the things that I'm shooting for. I make my people do the same thing. I don't make them. I do it with my students every year. In January, we bring in stacks of magazines, and it sounds a little sophomoric, but we all sit there with a cut and paste. You know, I tell them, please don't eat the glue. But they, they're sitting there cutting and pasting, and they put a board together of the things that they want. What's kind of scary is this, and you've done it. If you go to them at the end of the year, they've gotten a bunch of the stuff they put on the board, but if they didn't visualize it, if they, and I can walk into their office, and as I'm talking to them, I can see what they're looking for. This guy wants to get a Corvette, okay? And he wants to take off early. And I'm going to say, well, I guess you've given up on the Corvette. Well, what do you mean? Well, if you're leaving early, you're not going to hit your goal this month. Should we take the Corvette down? No, 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 no. And then they'll do a little bit more because I know what they're trying to get in their life. Unfortunately, we got sh we're short for time. I'm happy to talk with you afterwards on that. But no, anybody who disagrees with this stuff, that's fine. Um, like Joe, you're not going to believe everything that I say. If you take 10% of what he did, 10% of what we did, 10% from each speaker, it'll change stuff. Accountability. I hate to be held accountable. It's uncomfortable. I can fail at it. But every Tuesday morning at 6.30 in the morning, I'm on the phone with a guy in New Jersey named Kevin Shulman, same last name. He's also a Sandler trainer. We're not related. And I'm accountable to him. What'd you do this week? What did you move forward? How'd you do on this account? How'd you do about firing that person? And I do the same thing with him. And we get to call BS on each other. Do you have somebody that you're accountable? And are people accountable within your organization? And different generations don't want to be held accountable for the same things. True? Eric, I don't know if you know, but the gentleman, he's talking about how much is the check? 500 bucks? 1,000? Oh, God, yeah. I didn't tell you about that. Have somebody you're accountable to. I decide I'm going to be accountable to Chris. And we say we're going to make X number of calls. Or, and by the way, you can't be accountable for results. You can only be re re accountable for behaviors, OK? I cannot eat the ice cream. I may not lose the weight right away, but not eating the ice cream is the action. If I'm going to make 50 calls a day or 50 calls a week, whatever we agree to, and I'm going to hold two meetings a day, and I get on the phone with Chris, what I do is I send Chris a check for $500 from not my personal account. Ice cream. Not eating not ice cream. Not eating ice cream. Yeah. If I, if I send Chris a check for 500 bucks from my personal account, he sends me a check, I put it up over my desk. The first week that he doesn't do what he's accountable for, I get to cash his check. And he has to send me another one. And the first week that I don't do it, he gets to cash my check. Now, it could be 100 bucks, it could be 1,000 bucks. It has to be a meaningful amount. But here's the thing. You will do more to save that $100 than you will to make 10,000. So put yourself, it's called a self-trapping exercise. Put yourself in that trap, and now you've got to live with it. You'll do more to hang on to that 500 bucks than you will to make 50 grand. 
What? The boot traditionalists aren't really in the workforce anymore. Boomers want stated objectives and to tell them what's going on. These are the results I expect. These are the objectives you're working with. I want a checklist. That's what you guys want. Generation X wants to know why and how we're going to do these things. Ask open-ended questions with them. You can't go, OK, we're going here. That's the path. Off you go. Say, why do you think we want to go there? Well, because we're going to do this. OK, how are we going to get there? OK. Generation Y, you want to sit down with them and work out a methodology to get to specific goals. They're a little bit more kind of look a squirrel type people. So sit down and go, what are the methodologies you're going to use? You are thinking hand holding and be that as it may. The millennials want to know what's their impact to the company. They want to see that what they're doing actually fits in overall in this scheme of things. They don't want to feel like a little tiny cog in a great big wheel. They want to see how much they are. If they're a little cog, you take that little cog out, the big wheels don't turn either. So show them how they're accountable. They want to matter. You know, certain genera my generation, just get out of my way, I'll do it. And the baby and the, and, and the millennials, they want to be part of something, feel like they're part of something. You have to treat these people differently. You have to hold them accountable differently. My mom told me I was special. Anybody's mom tell me we were special? That was in a different way, though, Carson. Yeah. <laughs> Not having a common sales language. I put a picture of the Sandler submarine up there. It's the, it's the methodology that I've utilized for 46 years. I picked it up in 83. I read a book. By the way, wrong way to learn how to do anything is out of a book. I've read the Ben Hogan book on golf. I still can't break 80. I can hardly break 90, right? But it, I read the book, right? Having a process that you follow. This is the process that I have found that works for me. It cuts my sales cycle in half. It increases my close ratio. It makes the client convince me that they need what I've got, that they've got the money, and that I'm dealing with the decision maker before I ever present to them. Sales is qualify, present, and close, correct? What I teach and what I do is qualify and close, and then just tell them what they said they wanted to buy. You present after they've said yes. It's a little different. And ABC in sales means always be? No, always be curious. Stop closing. Never close. Let the prospect give up and ask for help. <coughs> write, write this one down. People love to buy. They hate to be. So stop trying to sell people stuff. Find out what they want to buy. You don't have to sell them anything. Whether it's this language or another language, you've got to have a process that your people follow because you can debrief. Now, I can sit down with anybody in here who uses my process, and they can tell me they had a great sales meeting, and I can say, can we debrief it? And I literally can take them through each compartment, and if they can't fill that compartment out, then they didn't have a good sales meeting, and they will discover in the debrief, oh, crap, I missed a step. Is it good to know that you missed something? You can go back and fix it. How, do, how does this work with the different generations, though? Put the coffee down. <laughs> no one's seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross? Come on. But if you haven't seen the movie, by the way, just Google or YouTube Alec Baldwin seen Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. The language will upset some of you, but it's fun. But it defines sales in a five-minute scenario. That makes sense to some people. But for others, it doesn't because they never saw the movie. <coughs> do you phone somebody? Do you text them? Do you email them? Do you message them on Instagram or Snapchat? I had a guy who was in a sales position. And I had a guy I was trying to get a hold of. I called him every week. And we had met at a show. Oh, yeah, I really want to do this. Call me, please. Cool, this is a great warm lead. And I'm calling him. And I'm calling him. I said, oh, yeah, Bob can't talk to you right now. But he says, keep calling. Okay. And after a month and a half of this, I said, this is insane. So I sent him a text. I got an answer in 30 seconds. I don't know how many messages I left him. Doesn't pick up the phone. Kids today won't pick up the phone. They don't like calling. It's rude. They feel like you're interrupting them. Yeah. You're interrupting. I don't want to interrupt them. I'm not going to call him, but I'll text him. If my phone rings right now, I have to pick it up if I want to answer. I don't. I just said ignore and let you leave a message. If you leave a message, I know it's a valid call.
but it's an interruption. By the way, your phone and the internet is an interruption of an interruption of an interruption. If I'm standing here and my phone rings, I go, hold on, that's an interruption. I pick it up and I look at it and I say, I don't want to take that call. So I hit no, but when I do, at the top it says, ooh, you got an email from a customer that says, what do you intend to do? Ooh, hold on, let me get that. That's an interruption. Then once you go to the web page, you got all these ads flashing at you. That's another interruption. That's just on the sites that you go to. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a technology of an interruption, of an interruption, of an interruption. So realize that's all your phone is, is an interruptive device. And what you're doing is you're telling people that you're not as important as this call. And that devalues you in, in their eyes. And it devalues the relationship. If you got a baby boomer, call them. If you have a Gen Xer, email them. If you have a Gen Y, send them a text message. If you have a millennial, get a Snapchat or an Instagram account. What's Snapchat? It's this thing. You just okay. Pictures. Different, like different generations. Um, number six, not focusing on lead generation. How many of you have had good months and bad months in sales? Okay, up and down. The reason that is, is, is a behavior issue. One of the things that I do, and I tell people this, I am a behavior animal. I will do what I need to do every single day, and I don't work the kind of hours that Joe works. I only work half days. Any 12 hours you pick, that's when I'm working. Okay? Um, and I found that every time that sales are off, I can look back in my pipeline and see that 30, 60, 90 days ago, I stopped doing my behaviors. How long is your sales cycle? Tim, in your world, how long is the sales cycle? From hello to yes or no? Three to six months. Three to six months. Todd, in your world? A year. A year. And in your world? Three to six months. Three to six months. Mine's probably a month to 90 days in most cases. Um, I'm not a good enterprise guy. I'm, I'm, I'm good for shorter sales cycles. I know that weakness in myself, OK? You know, I, after, after 90 days, I get bored. I'm easily distracted by bright, shiny objects. Um, so I'm, I know that I, if I don't get this moved along in a certain period of time, it's going to fade off the radar because new and shinier things pop up. But I find that every time my sales drop off, I wasn't doing my behaviors. But talking, it doesn't matter where you grew up, complete these sentences that your mother taught you. Uh, children should be seen and not heard. It's impolite to talk about. Words. Don't chew your food with your mouth. Cold um, don't talk to. Strangers. What's cold calling? Talking to. What your mom teach you? Don't talk to. What's your boss telling you? Call the. Do you understand why you have call reluctance? It's your mother's fault. <laughs> most, of, most of the problems we have in sales are your mother's fault, right? Your mother te trained you to hate, hate the word no in the first five years of your life. No, right? No, 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 like a, like a machine gun. So why do younger people, why do people of different generations have trouble with this? You don't, like we play well people. together, don't we? <laughs> you like people who are like you. Okay, I have a friend. I know I was Climber School, Andy Brown. Andy graduated from the University of Florida. He was born in Florida, raised in Florida, and went to UF. He wanted to get away from it. So he went to BC for his master's. When he got to Boston, what's the first thing he did? He started trying to find somebody who liked Leonard Skinner and the Gators. In Boston? In Boston. Boston. So even when you say you're doing this to get away from yourself, you don't. You look for people like you. And when you look at lead generation, you unconsciously want to speak to other people. It's a room full of CEOs. We like talking to each other. You understand. If I talk to somebody who's a director of marketing, they don't understand the finance problems. They don't understand operational issues. Only another CEO. So you tend to gravitate towards that. Find out what your key demographic is and staff your bench. We're going to talk about that more. For that demographic. Because if not, you'll have, what did you do? I talked to five people. What do they do? Oh, this one guy plays really good guitar. Carson, you're supposed to be doing this. I'll look for people that are like me if I'm left to my own devices. Make sure you define what you're looking for. Well, part of that also, and, and was to, Joe touched on it earlier, is, 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 is we're different communication styles. How many of you understand what DISC is? OK, about half of you. I'm a high D, high I. I want to be in charge, but let's have fun while we do it. 
Carson is a high I, high I. We got beer afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> he wants to have fun wherever he is. I have to keep my eye under control. My wife is a CD. She'll tell you how it gets done, the order it gets done. There will be lists and check marks involved. She'll be in charge, and she doesn't care if you have fun. Opposites attract. Look at your spouse, your significant other. They are the opposite of you, right? Talk about somebody completing you. Well, opposites attract. After two to five years, opposites attack. <laughs> Understanding, you're not only going to, and if you can only sell to people, D's are 10% of the world. If I can only sell to other high D's, I lose 90% of my prospect base. I have to be able to change my style. The Sandler rule is this. They will not change their buying style to match your selling style. You must change your selling style to match their buying style. Not about being disingenuous, but I've got to calm it down a little bit. I've got to be a little bit more nurturing. I tend to teach from nurturing parent. I am not a nurturing guy, ask my wife. But I've learned to nurture because there's money in it. Lead generation. Learn this about yourself. Learn to modify. You'll do better and be able to talk to more people. Nine minutes left. We only have 11 more of these to go. <laughs> Not capturing best practices. My mom makes marble cake. And no one was ever able to duplicate it because we all followed the recipe. Joe's mom made spaghetti sauce, right? And it never turned out like mom or like grandma made because she never really quantified it. You know, a pinch of this, a pinch of that. If you stood there while she's cooking and as she was about to put the pinch in, you put your hand under it and measured it, you would then have her best practices and be able to duplicate that spaghetti sauce, that marble cake. What about the things that go on in your business? Is there a key person in your business that if he or she walked out today, there would be a hole and none of that stuff is documented someplace? If your best and key person got hit by a car, God forbid, today, how would it affect your business if that's not documented? I was in the Air Force, I was on a flight crew, and every time we landed, we sat down and debriefed the mission. And after action reports are critical, it's where you capture best practices, it's where you find out what didn't work. Older generations don't mind meetings, they understand the need. The younger generations, come on, why are we here, why are we here? And an after action report has to be thorough one step at a time. So explain to them why. This is why we're going through this one step at a time. After a few meetings, they'll start to get the idea. But at first, explain to them why we're doing this, and it's so painstaking. There's a book by Patrick Lexicon called Death by Meeting. Read it. Stand, do standing meetings. Failing to train and coach your management staff. We hire people who are experienced to manage. How much time do you spend growing your managers? You guys are growing yourself right here, but you've got managers who probably could get an awful lot out of a class like this. Have you taken their time? Do you send them to programs? Are you educating managers? We teach a class once a month that's strategic management. We're going to start the organizational excellence program this month. And the people who come get a tremendous amount out of it. It's time away from the office. You turn off the phones. You can focus on growth, using the time in the airplane or in the car to learn rather than to play you know, Candy Crush or check Facebook. I mean, come on. We don't live virtually, we live in the real world. Um, how about coaching millennials? Very different than coaching baby boomers, true? You're back to disc. If I'm the real me, the I, the Carson, the good time guy, and Joe is my boss, and you've got a little D in you, we're not gonna get along unless we understand what motivates each other. He's not gonna be a good manager to me. He's gonna come and go, do this, 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 this. I'm like, well, you know, hey, who got the new Corvette? Carson, what? We're Focus. doing this. Yeah, but it's really cool color. If we understand each other, we can get along better. But if we don't understand this is who I am, this is who he is, you're going to have real difficulties with managing. Right. And it's not, it's not just generational, you know, uh, different cultures, uh, male versus female. Uh, U.S. born versus non-U.S. born. You've got to coach these people differently. There are different expectations. Not building the bench. I touched on this earlier. We recruit when we have a hole. I recruit, the two best hires I've ever made is when I wasn't looking. Somebody came across my path. I said, let's sit down and talk. And it turned into be an eight-year relationship the first time. Um, 
with the gentleman who worked for me, and it was a good relationship for both of us. But I wasn't looking to hire when he first stuck his face in my door. Are you looking for your next superstar? Are you looking for your next manager? Or are you just filling slots at the bottom and promoting from within? Do you have managers who really shouldn't be managing? I am an excep exceptionally good salesperson. Um, all false modesty aside, I'm probably one of the best salespeople you'll ever meet. I am a lousy manager. I know that about myself. So I don't manage. I have people manage for me. Why? I know my strengths. I know my weaknesses. So building the leadership bench is a little different than building the lower echelon bench. These people are tougher to find, and it takes more time. Anything on the generations on that? If I'm selling to a surgeon, and I don't understand if our company's demographic is surgeons, you want people that relate to surgeons, that the surgeons feel like they're like me. So you can train people that aren't like surgeons to work with them, the key word there being train them. Ever see the movie The Intern, where Robert De Niro at 70 decides he wants to go back to work and he, he signs up as an intern? I think Anne Hathaway was his boss. It was a great movie, but it explains it. There's a lot of people that are older that may leave a business, they want to still keep working, and they're working for a manager who is a generation or two younger than them. If your younger people don't know how to manage the baby boomers and the Gen Xers, it's the same problem in both directions. Not knowing how to coach. Leadership skills. You've got supervising, you've got coaching, you've got training, and you've got mentoring. We tend to choose our own mentors. But training is implementing and putting a skill in their hands. Coaching is watching them swing the club and say, no, 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 keep your elbow in. And the best executor is not necessarily the best coach. Michael Jordan was an exceptionally good basketball player. Up to that time, probably the best in history. Tiger Woods is an amazing golfer. They all have coaches, right? Do their coaches play golf or basketball better than them? No, but the coach can show them because the coach is looking from the outside and can say, you probably don't realize this, but when you do this, you're left, oh, I didn't realize that. And the coach can catch things that you won't catch. You're, you know, in the, what is it, a dog in the, in, the, in, the, in the hunt doesn't stop the scratch fleas? If you get somebody that can coach you, it'll help you improve at what you do much more quickly. You think that everybody is just like you. You think everybody thinks just like you, because well, my way is obviously the right way. If you people would just do what I say, it would be a lot better world. Everybody feels that way. But with five generations, four disc styles, and two sexes, two and a half percent of the population thinks the way you do. My notes in my little notebook, when I learned this fact, say they don't think like you, they are vitally interested in the Kardashians. And that's about as far away from me as you get. But think about that. These other people you're working with, they live and die by what Kim and Chloe and all those people do. They're not like you. They're not at all like you. Only 2.5% of the people are just like you. Realize the fact that you're alone in your island. Yes, and, and life is not a movie starring you. You are not the center of the universe. Yes, it is. Uh, he's an I. <laughs> the D knows he's the center of the universe, right? The D, if I say it, it must be true, right? 11, not sharing the vision with those who have to implement it. If the people in your organization don't know what you're shooting for, I'm going to be 68 years old in July. Uh, I was at Woodstock, okay? I actually remember most of it. And yes, I did inhale, right? Um, <laughs> that was the point. Um, <laughs> I'm about five or six years away from retiring. I've Plan it out. Uh, Mike Aldrich over there and I have joined forces. He's another Sandler trainer. He and I have joined forces. Why? Because he's getting his practice started. I've got five or six more years to go. And we sat down and had a long talk about that before we decided to get together. Why? He needed to know what my vision was. I needed to know what his vision was. And it coincided. I was not looking for it at the time. But just like recruiting, somebody came to me and he said, hey, maybe we should work together. I said, let's talk. And it turned out to be a marriage. I actually like his wife much better than I like him. <laughs> you can do baby boomers and Gen X in a large auditorium and explain the company's vision. And they'll get it. But with the Gen Y and the millennials, it's a lot better one-on-one. -on -one. They want to ask questions. They want to pepper you with questions continually. Answer their questions. They want to see how they fit in. 
The baby was just wanting to know what the, what's the goal for the month, now get out of my way. Yeah. Got to manage them and, 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 and different. Oh, I love this one. A culture of learned helplessness. I am guilty of this, and most of you are. You ever been on a sales call with a, a new sales rep, and you see them failing and flailing, and you see it, you know, eh, eh, eh. you know, the plane is beginning to go into the death spiral, and you jump in and you save the deal. You've just taught them to depend on you. What do, what do we say? That the more dependent your business is on you, the less your business is worth. So you've got to let them fail. And as an owner, and as a salesperson, I have a hard time doing that. But you've got to let your kid fall off the bike. You learn from your mistakes. Boomers want to be valued. Gen X, don't confuse casualness with their professional ability. Just because somebody's in jeans and a t-shirt means they have no idea of style. It doesn't mean they're not good at their job. Gen Y likes verbal public praise. You're such a good instructor, Eric. I think everybody can see that. Ooh, that feel better? Make me feel good, right? You want to make a millennial feel good? Tell them, dude, you can turn this company around. You make a difference. You can turn it around. And that's, that's your smile. See, that's <laughs> what works with them. Praise for boomers. Don't consider casualness a bad thing with Gen X. Gen Y, praise them in public. And the millennials, you can turn this company around. You can turn this company around. You say, I could give a crap. How much do I make if I do this? Motivated differently. Methodologies and systems. Are you, I, 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 want to, I was looking for a picture of a reverse pyramid. Most of us have our business balanced on our head as opposed to the other way around having systems and controls and processes in place. We started up as an entrepreneur. You started in your two downstairs bedrooms, right? You grew your business. And if you take a look at your business years later, a lot of them were still doing this with the business balanced on our head. You have to have processes and methodologies. And the younger generations not only want that, they expect that, true? Right. Baby boomers want a document they can hold in their hands. They're comfortable with that. Gen X is happy getting a PDF off of the server. Gen Y wants it to look like a web page. And the millennials want it to be an app on their phone. The good news is it's all the same database. It's just how you view that database. My son works for Dick's Sporting Goods, and they have an app. And he says, oh yeah, three touches to get my hours. I said, man, you're lazy. And he said, no, dad. Because of Frederick Taylor's time and motion studies in the 50s, and oh, great, he's, he goes to school here. And so, <laughs> but he's right, he's right. Three touches to get the hours that you work. And think of the job you had when you were a teenager. What did you have to do to find out what hours you work next week? Now it's three touches on a phone. My dad said I'd be a good engineer because I was lazy and I'd figure out the easiest way to do it. And that's what it's becoming. So don't think that they're lazy just because they have this. No, it's the time and motion studies of the 50s taken into the next level is where we've come to. Well, you talked about being lazy. Most salespeople are what I call ambitiously lazy. That's why I got into sales. I wanted to make a lot of money. I didn't want to have to sweat in order to do it. That's probably why a lot of you started out in sales. So having the methodologies and systems in place. Um, questions and comments. Any comments or questions? Yes. Um, over the years, we've, we've all heard the differences between the generations. In reality, a lot of times we all realize we're all the same. I mean, it's the same human characteristics that we all experience and grow. It's just technology. But the way that you guys showed it is more that they actually physically think differently. Emotionally, they think differently. Yeah. That, that's, I guess that's a, it's yeah, I, a I, emotional intelligence. I grew up in the 50s, and my, my mom used to put me down in front of what you called the babysitter. It was the TV, right? My daughter, who I just got back from my granddaughter up in, in North Carolina, doesn't allow the child much screen time at all. They literally keep screens away from her. So there's a very difference in the way we were raised, what was important to us, how we function, how we interact with the world. And this is what we have to be aware of. Um, if anybody would like to attend the program we're doing on the 21st, give me a business card, and I'll send you an invite. 
Uh, we've got room for about 30 people, and that's it. It's about half full, so we've got about 12 or 15 seats. If you have questions on sale or want to attend a class, again, give us a, give us a card. Just write free class on the back. We'll send you an invite to that. Any other questions? Or, yeah. Everybody, lace their fingers, please. Yeah, put your fingers okay. together like this. Now put them together the other way. Move the other thumb on top. Yeah. Now, it doesn't feel comfortable, does it? You can do it. It's like crossing your legs. Cross your legs and then cross them the other way. It's not comfortable. You can do it. But you prefer to have your fingers laced and your legs crossed in a certain way. That's what we're talking about. Being comfortable, making the people feel comfortable with the style you're communicating to them. And here's the thing. If I told you you were going to double your income by putting your hands together like this instead of like this, how many would you change how you put your hands together? Do that with your workforce. Yeah. I'm just saying I'm done with you. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you.